Um, okay, everyone. Hi, welcome to our Diverse Careers Workshop. Um, so we're first going to start with the BES Racial, Ethnic Inequality and Diversity Network, which is a support network for people of all ages at any stage of their career who have an underrepresented or marginalised ethnicity within ecological, environmental and related communities. Um, they prepared five day in the life videos for us. These include Ruben Fakoya's day working from home as a psychological researcher from the NHS, Kaliana Lodia's day as a wildlife filmmaker and photographer, Jehan Jeffrey's day as a director and producer at the National Film and Television School, Bushra Abu Halalil's day as a zoology PhD student, and Eroldo Diaz's talking about his research within tropical forests and their importance. Afterwards, there'll be time for a Q&A session with Bushra, Rubin and Arildo, um, who have joined us today. Um, before I'll hand over to Tanith, who will host the talks by Professor Helen Roy from the Royal Entomological Society and UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, Dr. Hale Jackson from the Woodland Trust and Sharon Harrell from Butterfly Comfort Conservation. Um, and during our Q&A sessions and discussions, we'd encourage you to um, switch on your cameras and microphones if you feel comfortable to participate. Um, so if we just want to start the day in the life videos. Hi everyone, I'm Kalyani and I'm a wildlife TV researcher and photographer based in the UK. Now you're probably wondering, why am I sat alone in my car in the pitch black at 5am, especially since I'm not a morning person? That's because I'm off to see one of the UK's most incredible natural spectacles, the Red Deer Rut. I've got my tripod, my batteries are charged, my memory cards are in and we're ready to go. So I've arrived at the park and as you can see it is still pretty dark 
but luckily most of the rutting activity happens at dawn and dusk and also that is the best time for lighting so everyone's a winner except for also me because I am exhausted. So you'd think that finding deer in the dark would be really difficult, but one of the main features of the deer rutting season is the really loud calls that the stags make. I'm not sure if you just heard that, but that's the sound that I'm heading towards. So I found my spot, got everything set up, and now I'm just waiting for the sun to come up. So I don't know if you can hear that, but there are a few stags calling and I think they're starting to warm up now, ready for the big display. So I've made sure I'm a really safe distance away from the deer, which is recommended to be at least 100 metres during the rutting season. And that's because red deer are the UK's largest land animal with stags weighing up to 190 kilos. So you definitely don't want to be on the wrong end of one of those, particularly when they're pumped with testosterone, ready to fight to the death. So as you can see, the sun is really starting to come up and the stags are becoming more and more active as they wake up, just like me. So it's about nine o'clock in the morning now and I really need to start heading back ready for my day job making wildlife documentaries. So thank you so much for joining me and I really hope you enjoyed it and see you soon. Bye! Hey! Ugh. Hey, my name is Ruben and this is my day in the life of a researcher for the NHS. So as a researcher for the NHS I currently work on um, one main study called the PATH study. It's an EU funded study that is looking at alleviating stigma associated with perinatal mental illness. 
when I say perinatal mental illness, I mean like postnatal depression or mild to moderate forms of postnatal depression and anxiety in mothers and fathers. Um, it's an evaluative study, so I'm actively overseeing the evaluation of this massive multi-million dollar, well, euro um, project, and I have written a few protocols and stuff, well, research studies coming out from that massive um, project, essentially. Uh, and my day-to-day -day activities is managing and overseeing those protocols, all the studies, um, actively liaising with uh, my colleagues uh, across the EU, nationally and locally. Um, I, it, it, it's a lot. I love it. Um, it's a slight deviation away from ecology, but in a way, humans are animals. So I'm kind of fulfilling um, that satisfaction in ways. Um, but yeah, like I feel like I need to show you how I'm able to do this all from working from home. So my day normally starts at 8.30 a.m. Um, I just begin to like plan what I'm gonna do. It normally takes a few minutes, but I then, will begin to think about what I'm going to wear but first I have to have a shower and this normally takes a second and I'm done <laughs> um, but um, yeah I then have breakfast which is just mainly just muesli a bit of fruit and nuts something quick but keeps me full up until midday and then I check my emails and this go out throughout the day but I normally begin checking my emails, just answering a few from like, the previous evening. Then going to meetings, normally team meetings, other meetings, cross-border meetings, but a lot of meetings too. And then my bulk of my work is the PATH protocol, essentially. This protocol is mainly uh, looking at the face-to-face -face elements. Um, I write a few sections. I think I'm looking at the background at the moment. So um, reading papers online, getting information and answering comments from um, the research and governance and the research facilitator um, my essentially my boss that has done a brief review of what's been done and I'm just answering that have a bit of lunch quick bang easy go back to work and yeah just answering calls so a lot of my work is like managing the sites that are running prior um, research projects I've I've written um, just seeing everything's okay, chilling, relaxing. This is also very important for working at home. Like being at a desk all day, you can't do, it's impossible. So I like to just kill some time. Um, looking outside, going back to work, Webinars and same old. And, and yeah, I think that's basically my whole day. Um, I like to look outside a lot, just taking the sights, looking at sunset and kind of just contemplate um, what I've been doing. Okay, well that concludes um, my day in a life or working from home as a researcher for the NHS or just a researcher just in general. Um, even though this is in psychological research, this day is actually quite typical of, I think in all domains of science. I think there's this interpretation that you are always working on the field, working on, you know, in extravagant locations and, you know, really exotic and working with exotic, you know, species. And that's not always the case. I think 80% of your time is quite typical of what I've just shown you. Um, and that doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean it's boring. Like, I love my job. You know, I love um, actively reading papers, actively contributing to research. Um, and hopefully this shows you an alternative route that studying zoology or ecology can take you. Um, I think a lot of people are just often a bit disillusioned and hopefully you can see that you can use uh, a degree in ecology and zoology in various different ways and this is one of many. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening and tuning in. Peace.
My name is Bushra Abu Halil. I'm a third year PhD zoology student and vice chair of the Reed Network, and each of my days can look a little different. Like many PhD students, I spend a lot of time in the lab. My project is specifically focused on poultry. I'm looking for novel ways to monitor their health and welfare through their poo. So I do a lot of microbiology, immunology, metablomics, and bioinformatics. But that's not all. I love all animals. Although I have been passionate about chickens since I was a child, I really love just being outside in nature and enjoying the countryside. I really love to engage in local conservation work, such as monitoring the Norfolk Fenlands for otter and water vole population, once again using their poo. The wetlands in the UK are basically like our rainforest. They're so diverse and we have so much nature from the birds and also the insects. We have dragonflies, there are also mayflies, not to mention the pollinators such as the bees and the butterflies. We have so many different types of birds. We may even be able to hear a greater bittern on the river, plus plenty of swans, ducks and moorheads. Every Sunday, I present my very own radio show, Nature and Nonsense, with More Music Radio, a community station based in the Fenlands in Norfolk. I talk about conservation, local wildlife initiatives, and important nature news that you might not have heard during the week. All that, plus plenty of great tunes, because I always say, music and nature, there is something out there for everyone. Although each of my days can look a little different, they always end in the same way. Me enjoying an evening walk with my dogs. Hi everyone, my name is Arildo Diaz. I'm a forest ecologist currently. I'm working as guest researcher at Goethe University in Germany. My research is focused on plant biodiversity and forest conservation. I've been spending most of my research time studying tropical forests in Amazon and Atlantic forests in Brazil. Tropical forests are very important ecosystems from regulating global climate to providing livelihood for indigenous communities. But uh, nowadays, one of the main threats to tropical forests is deforestation. Do you know that 40% of commodities trading are related to deforestation? This is a huge number. Commodities are products such as palm oil, soy and minerals. But we, as individuals, can have a strong role to stop deforestation. How? Basically, in two main ways, individually and collectively. As individuals, we can change our consumption habits. For example, we can buy certified products from companies that are not involved in deforestation and in the exploitation of labor force. We can also change our, our eating habits, for example, uh, eating less meat because uh, one of the main uh, commodities produced nowadays is soy which is used for livestock so if we decrease meat consumption we also decrease the demand for this commodity and of course this is also good for our health as citizens we can also demand the politicians to include in their top priorities tackle the biodiversity and climate crisis and stop deforestation and maybe the best way and the most effective way to do that is to engage ourselves in collective movements and non-violent movements that demand this clearly from politicians. So let's get to work and thanks for watching. Just about to head off in my dad's car because 
my car has no petrol, uh, so he's he can work from home. I need to drive into uni. There's my car there, through the rain. And yeah, no petrol. What a life. What a sad little life you live, Boris. I hope you're happy with Brexit. So I'm currently at my school, the National Film Intelligence School, I suppose it's technically a university. And yeah, I've been for the past one and three quarter years, been doing a degree in directing and producing science and natural history films. Uh, I had sort of a varied journey to get here. I did zoology uh, which I, at University of Leicester, which I graduated from in 2016. Then for four, maybe four years, yeah, about four years, I was working in payroll and admin and really didn't want to do it. And yeah, eventually uh, found myself here after going on a diploma course, um, a wildlife filmmaking diploma course, and now I'm here. And so hoping to make films in the future that centre uh, voices that we don't normally hear from. So I hope that's what happens and going in the future. Yeah, I'll show you a little bit of what I'm doing next. And now we're currently um, editing a film with the chair, the man himself, Big Ruben. And yeah, going well. So that was us in the edit. A lot of, a lot of work, long hours, just trying to get the film where we want it to be. Hopefully we'll get it to where we need to in time. We've only got a couple more weeks in the edit. And yeah, that's all for now. Uh, that's a day in my life at the moment. Just long, long days in an edit room with my editor. And yeah, uh, have a good day, everyone. Wow, that was such a like diverse range um, of careers there. That was also just very entertaining. <laughs> um, so thank you so much to the Read Network for showing some of those um, sort of showcase of potential careers. And I think we've got some of them here today. Um, so it might be nice to have a, a quick chat about some of those videos, some of the topics that were discussed. Um, if anyone's got any questions or any comments, please just throw them in the chat. Um, great to hear anyone's thoughts. I'd like, just like to ask any of you how you manage all of these things that you're all up to. How do you balance them all, um, both you know your work and all those other interests and getting up early in the morning to go and look at a deer? How do you find that? Uh, well, it's difficult. Don't get much sleep, but I don't know. You just kind of, whenever, you have, whenever I have a free second, I kind of just use my calendar and kind of, juggle things around make sure that I find time to make it work and then I don't know just I think I just run on adrenaline <laughs> I was gonna add to this as well like I think when you really love what you do even if you're exhausted even when you're so tired at the end of the day you've still got such like a sense of satisfaction at the end of it like even though you're super tired even though I just want to curl up into bed I am really really happy with how I've spent my day so yeah, I think that's definitely a, a good motivation for it. Um, for me, I've always lived my life at like 100 miles per hour. So I've always had so many different things going on at one time. Um, and it definitely helps me now in managing the PhD, doing the radio, doing other volunteering too. So that definitely helped. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with Bushra. I've always just, my life has always been 100 miles per hour. And I think it would be, I've always tried to fill in something else to do you know I think at all times so whether, whether it's you know working full time the network mm -hmm. photography um it's just I think I'm just it's natural for me to be trying to balance everything and time manage even though I like as Kalyani said I just I have no time like, I'm always busy and it's just sometimes it's hard to like manage like your social life too um yeah yeah Yeah, j j just to add, uh, uh, yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, 
especially when we are doing something that we like, it's um, it make uh, I think it much easier to, to to deal with all the, the the time we have to manage and everything. And this um, and I think this is uh, this is one of the the best things. Then when you can can work with uh, things that you like. So I, I remember, for example, when I have to do field work, is is really stressful. You have to wake up very early in the morning, but uh, when you go inside the forest and see all that the animals and plants was something that uh, really refill my energy and I can can do the things that at the end of the day still be happy. Yeah, that's great. I'm actually going on from that. You mentioned in your video about um, sort of activism and getting involved in that and the sort of more political side of, of things. Um, I think that's such an important an important element of the kind of work that we all do um what kind of sort of do you have any suggestions for getting involved in that kind of thing or or anything like that um well i i, I think uh i think i think maybe the most important thing is that when we have uh, we, we want to to do something is to is to to search because uh, actually th there there are a lot of things already being done uh, in a lot of groups and peeps uh, uh, people together uh, the, the red network uh, it's, a, it's a great example for them uh, of how people get together and start to um, to find ways to to deal with this question about the the systemic racism in academia and uh, and I think yeah I think it is basically that uh, I myself uh, in some moment I, I specifically about this this question about the reasons for example I start to, to question myself a lot and, and start to find and then for example I, I found um, the Ruben uh, blog for BIS and then I decided oh let's try to to contribute to as much as I can and yeah nowadays uh, luckily we have a lot of movements uh, non violent movements uh, like the climate for for future so i, I think it's uh, is more a matter that we we see what um, fits more to to our personality or how the way we 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 act and want to to contribute but uh, i think it uh, is basically search and approach the people because i think Sometimes, especially for myself, I, I, I had this uh, difficult how to do, but I think the most important thing was just to approach and, and talk with the people because in general, people are, are very open and, and, and they just want to collaborate, it, I think. I think that's a really good point there about finding what you feel comfortable doing and, and where you can best fit into that as well. So, you know, there's all sorts of different forms of activism or ways you can contribute um, to you helping the environment and I think yeah that makes a really good point that discovering what that is and finding those people who can help with that um is key yeah definitely um yeah sort of going on from there um does anyone want to mention anything else about the read network and sort of what it does and how anyone could potentially get involved in it if they if they were interested yeah um the read network is essentially just uh uh, a space to, of support for people of you know um, minority backgrounds um, and it's essentially a place to celebrate ecology um, to almost bridge the gap between certain opportunities that you might you might not necessarily be um, aware of so we work with other organizations and almost like direct information to our members um, at the moment we uh, we have almost like a mailing list. So if you just contact myself or Bushra, um, we can add you to that mailing list and we have like a collection. We've got like over 60 members now, um, but we have plans of actually having a strong social media presence. But, and as we've got a new snazzy logo that's just been designed. So we're on the process of like actually expanding and actually having our footprint um, officially on the internet. Um, but and that should be in the next few weeks actually so um but yeah the read network is here as, as a support network um it, it, it essentially uh helps group as i like to say icebergs um in ecology i think uh, especially from my experience of being 
which is what, I think the only black person in zoology at university. I felt like I was the only person studying that zoology or ecology. And then I feel like the network as a whole serves at almost kind of connecting those dots um, of people from in just working or studying in, in um, environmental sciences and ecology. And by, um, by doing that, it acts as a, or as a form of representation that will hopefully, you know, encourage more people a look like myself, Kalyani, Aroda and Bushra into ecology and, and conservation zoology and hopefully, you know, solve a lot of the um, lack of representation um, in the field. I was just going to add on to that as well. I think one of the exciting things about the Reed Network is although some of us here are engaged either professionally or academically in ecology or zoology, the network is made up of a whole range of people. There are people who are wildlife enthusiasts or birders, you know, they're not engaged with it on a regular daily basis, but they still recognise actually how much you can get from this kind of network, from the support, from sharing our experiences as well. I mean, Ruben's experience of being the only black person on a zoology course was an experience that I also had. And when we first had our meeting in the network, really realized so many of us had all these really similar experiences and it was really empowering actually to finally make these connections and to kind of meet other people who care about animals as much as you do who care about the environment as much as you do but also recognize what barriers you've experienced in getting to the place where you're at I think that's a really good point about yeah finding that community and sharing that experience that kind of then makes it not you know you're not alone in that anymore um, is really key and yeah I think that the the fact that you can be an ecologist or a biologist or a conservationist without having it as your main job as without having you know being paid for it you can still you can still identify as that and still make a contribution um, so it's really brilliant that the Reed Network is open to anyone um, with that interest who might then be able to to get involved more it's really cool um, I'm just noticing the time so I think we'll move on now um, but if anyone has any questions or any comments or thoughts, uh, pop them in the chat. And if any of you want to stay around um, for a bit later on, we can have a bit more of a, a chat and discussion. Um, so we'll move on now um, to, uh, first of all, I think we've got uh, Professor Helen Roy. Um, she's a professor at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Her work focuses on the effects of environmental change on insect populations and communities, uh, as well as invasive on native species and their effects on biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, Helen is also co-chair of the IPBES uh, thematic assessment on invasive alien species, has won numerous awards and is involved in multiple citizen science projects. Somehow she also managed to fit in the time to be the president of the Royal Entomological Society. Um, but I will hand over to Helen now um, so she can tell you a bit more about this in person. Great. Thank you very much, Tanith, and to all of the um, organisers of this wonderful um festival. It's been really fantastic um, seeing all of the activities, um, both joining a little bit yesterday and seeing so much going on in Twitter. I didn't, should I share my screen? It doesn't really matter whether I share this slide or not, really. It was just so that you have a, a picture to look at rather than, yeah, feel rather free than me to just share talking. Should I share the screen now? Yeah. Just one moment. I will just bring up, um, whoops. Just one moment. It's I've lost where I am on, on my screens now. It's just opening, right. Oh, and it's not in the right place. Sorry for this. I'll be there in just one moment. Put it over there. Can you see a slide that says UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology at the top and Environmental Science for World where people in nature prosper? Yes, perfect. Great, I'll put it onto the slideshow so it fills the whole screen. Great. Just get... ah, great, hopefully you can still see that slide. Sorry for that slight delay. So yeah, I'm um, based at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and um, I, enjoy my work immensely there um, as an ecologist. Um, 
but I am also the president of the Royal Entomological Society. I'm also the chair for the Public Engagement Working Group within the British Ecological Society. And as Tanith mentioned, I'm also um, one of the co-chairs for one of the ITBES um, assessments. Um, so there's many, many things that I enjoy um, about the work that I do, um, but perhaps from that, you can see the sort of diversity of um, the diversity of, of work that I get to do in organizing organizations that I get to work with and um, many, many people all around the world. And I think that's really been something that I've enjoyed hugely throughout my career is that people and nature um, aspect to it. So one of my favorite things is supervising um, students. And I'm really delighted actually that Tanith is now one of my um, PhD students. And um, in the middle of this um, slide, you can see um, some of the other students who have had the great pleasure to work alongside and, and were there enjoying the British Ecological Society um, annual meeting. But I also enjoy being out in the field. Um, I run a ladybird survey as a volunteer, and um, that's where I get most of my field work um, nowadays, because a lot of my work is really based around a computer. And it was wonderful seeing the day in the life of videos and seeing um, how much particularly the aspect of being sitting at a computer uh, really resonated with me, but how much I still really enjoy that, how much I enjoy um, writing. Um, pouring over often other people's models um, and um, looking at the interpretation um, of them and um, contributing to public engagement events and science communication. Um, I love the variety of work that I have as an ecologist and I love working with many people from around the world um, through collaborations. And I think, you know, ITBES is really one of those um, just very enlightening collaborations that I'm having at the moment. And um, for example, being the co-chair of a thematic assessment, so I'm working with more than 80 experts from all around the world. And one of the things that I'm particularly enjoying about that is the diversity um, of that network, but then what that means in terms of what we actually deliver, how, how much more robust the, the outputs are going to be because of that diversity of people who are involved and also the diversity of information that we're bringing together. So I'm very much a natural scientist and I love graphs and I love data, um, but being part of that network, I'm also working along social scientists and people who are contributing indigenous local knowledge and just that bringing together of all of that information from all of the variety of sources is what's going to give us a complete picture to deliver that thematic assessment um, and some of the, the recommendations that will come from that. So that's just tremendously exciting and, and I'm learning from it all of the time. But I'm also passionate about science communication and public engagement and um, being um, a member of the British Ecological Society and the Royal Entomological Society. And I've been members of them both since I was a PhD student in the 1990s. And all through my career, I've gained so much as a consequence of being involved. And, and that also really resonated with me from one of the um, films earlier was that 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 aspect about getting involved and volunteering and um, being part of these communities. It's just really wonderful. Um, and it's really fantastic to see um, what changes can happen as a consequence of that um, all working um, together. And it's an absolute um, delight for me to be the president of the Royal Entomological Society. Um, I'm, the society was founded, as you can see from its logo in 1833. And um, I'm just a third woman who has been um, a president of that society. And I'm really looking forward um, to the diversity in terms of presidents and other roles um, going forward with the society. And um, I'm really very, very much enjoying um, being um, the president of the Royal Entomological Society. But I just wanted to finally say I have many, many people um, to thank for the, the wonderful career that I am enjoying and the wonderful collaborations and wonderful places that I go to and things that I get to do. And um, the, the picture on the beach there is of my family. So as well as being um, an ecologist, I'm, um, I have a family and I have two daughters who I am immensely proud of. And I have thoroughly enjoyed um, having a career alongside having 
having um, my two daughters. And um, at times they're very much um, intermingled with my career. They've been away with conf conferences with me, out in the field with me. And um, I feel tremendously um, fortunate um, to be part of their lives as well and watching their careers begin to um, develop. So I think that's probably enough for me. It's great to be here with you all and I'm looking forward to our discussions. Thanks so much, Helen. That was really insightful seeing like all of those different aspects that you've been involved with. Um, I mean, if anyone has any questions, we might have time for just one now and then we can open up to discussion after, after the other two presentations. Um, I guess one thing I I'm, would like to ask is, as sort of from the perspective of being involved in like learned societies and things, what sort of, what do you have to be involved in as president of the Royal Entomological Society? What sort of, what do you actually do as that, as part of that role? Well, I, it's really fascinating. I'm learning a huge amount. So I, I, I get to go to many committee meetings. I sit in many meetings, um, but those meetings are cover a whole variety of different topics, um, whether it be about um, the membership and thinking about um, ways in which the society can better serve its membership or in the publication committee and thinking about the journal side of things. So there's lots of committees that um, work to keep the society running, but it's also at times as well about the sort of day to day of the society, thinking about the strategy, thinking about the sort of forward look. Um, I've done a lot of work on bylaws and I never thought that um, I would do, do, such a, do such a thing when I was handed the bylaws, but it's been really wonderful to see how um, we can work on, on the bylaws to ensure we empower the membership. So it's, yeah, it's been really wonderful. Uh, but I also, I guess, perhaps the most enjoyable part is I just get to chat to a lot of people. I meet a lot of other entomologists and um, get to share enthusiasm um, with them even more frequently um, than I did before I was president of the Royal Entomological Society. That sounds amazing. I think, yeah, I think we've sort of seen that with the Read Network as well as what a resource societies can be and how much you can get from them as well as, you know, learning from being a part of them there's so many different roles you can play within a society um yeah, yeah I think we are what makes the societies we as the as the members of the societies and the community are are what makes those societies and um you know both the british ecological society the royal entomological society they have fantastic staff who are there um supporting and guiding us but they really rely on the input from the the members um in a lot of different ways and i think that definitely for me being directly involved um, I get far more from it than I than I give. That's for sure. Amazing. Um, I think we will move on now, um, but we will come back to you, Helen, if any questions pop up or if we all want to have a bit of a discussion later. Um, so we're next. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Hazel Jackson uh, couldn't make it today. She's unwell, but we have uh, Dr. Emily Gray standing in, and who is just truly inspiring. Um, she's come from a background in chemistry, um, but has made a way to being the research advisor for the Woodland Trust. Um, she's also been incredibly supportive of the Biodiverse Festival since its beginnings, so we can't thank her enough uh, for that. But um, Emily, if you would like to start your presentation or... Yeah, or... thank you, Tanith. You were definitely too kind there. There's a lot of effort that's gone into the Biodiverse Festival by all of the organisers, and I really applaud all of their hard work in, in putting the festival on. So thank you for putting on this, this great event. Um, so I'm Emily Gray, Dr. Emily Gray from the Woodland Trust. And um, we're really um, extremely pleased to be sponsoring the Biodiverse Festival for its second year. Um, and I've been such thoroughly enjoying the talk so far. Um, unfortunately, I'm not Dr. Hazel Jackson and she was really looking forward um, to sharing her experience with you um, here today, but she sends her massive apologies, um, as unfortunately she is unwell. Um, that means that I'm in here instead um, to share with you a little bit about my career so far and how I got into conservation um, from a background in chemistry. Um, and I also want to share with you some of the roles um, that are available at the Woodland Trust for people with a background interest in conservation. Um, but before I get, begin, just to go through some of my career history, I just want to acknowledge the huge amount of privilege that I have 
um, and I've experienced in my career journey as a white able-bodied cis woman um, and I recognize that there are many barriers um, to opportunities that I haven't experienced um, that make it harder for others to uh, access those opportunities. So I'm just going to bring up some slides. And I think my laptop has frozen. <laughs> can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you great. It says you've started sharing, but hasn't shown the, the slides yet. I'll, <laughs> I'll <might>. start. <laughs> I'll wait for that to catch up, but I'll carry on talking. <laughs> so um, I work for the Woodland Trust and we're the largest. Um, our vision is a UK rich in native woods and trees for people and for wildlife. Um, we plant woods and trees, we restore damaged woodlands, and we protect woods and trees from, from being destroyed. So I work as a conservation research advisor at the Woodland Trust, um, and I manage our conservation research program. Uh, we directly fund PhDs, case partnership PhDs, and small research grants. Um, my role is to manage and coordinate Woodland Trust involvement. interest practitioners and the wider public. Um, what I love about my job is that I get to support researchers directly um, with their research through funding. Um, I learn about the variety of interesting new research um, and use my science communication skills um, to tell other people about it. Um, as a little kind of side note, I also wanted to tell you all about um, the fact that we award small research grants um, up to 20,000 pounds. Conservation of UK woods and trees. Um, and we hope that our grant funding could be used to conduct pilot studies to help researchers secure larger grants um, and also give experience to early career researchers and first time grantees um, in leading applied conservation research projects. So if your research interests do happen to overlap with ours, um, then please do apply for funding from us. Um, you can contact me. Um, or research at woodlandtrust.org.uk to be notified um, when we next open our grant call. And my computer has come back to life, so I'm going to attempt to share it again. There we go. Um, so I want to just give you a, a really brief run through of kind of my career history to how I got to the, the Woodland Trust. Um, because it's a bit of a, a very background. So after I graduated from an undergraduate degree in chemistry, uh, I managed to get a place on a graduate scheme at the membership body for chemists, Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, and I spent a lot of time in different rotations going around the organization, um, where kind of different projects in different business areas of the professional membership body. Um, and my last placement was in the Chemistry World team, which is a membership magazine that covers articles on all aspects of chemical research. Um, so I used to write articles and I did some podcast interviews and things like that. Um, and while working with Chemistry World, I really, I realized that I love communicating science. Um, but as I was interviewing researchers about their fascinating research, um, I realized I wasn't quite done with academia yet and wanted to go back to do a, a PhD to actually do some of that research myself. Um, so some of the transferable skills that I learned on a graduate scheme um, were working on individual and team projects, uh, networking skills, uh, engaging people with science, communicating research, um, and really what a good work-life balance should look like, which I attempted to take um, to my PhD. Um, so I went back to the University of Surrey to study for my PhD um, in phytochemistry. Uh, so I looked at uh, developing an organic uh, botanical plant protection product from Larix byproducts, um, which basically means I was looking at what useful chemicals uh, we can find in large trees. Um, 
but as well as doing my actual PhD, I took up as many science communication activities as I could fit in um, around my, my research. So I entered as many um, uh, science communication competitions as I could, three minutes thesis competition. I did some stand up comedy uh, based on my PhD, which was absolutely terrifying, but it was also a lot of fun. So I'd recommend that if any of you uh, have that opportunity. Um, and I also did some of my own kind of science comms on Twitter by tweeting every day the highs and lows of, of my PhD life. So I learned a lot through my PhD, not just my research, um, and I learned a lot of transferable skills and project management and coordination, data analysis, time management, presentation skills, problem solving, perseverance, I think was an important one, um, and a huge satisfaction in finally um, completing writing a thesis. So after my PhD, actually while I was writing at my PhD, I started looking for jobs. Um, and I started working for a small biomedical research charity as a science communication officer. And this is actually different to my previous background in chemistry because it was biomedical research, but I used some of those transferable skills um, to get this job. And my main role here was to communicate everything related to the research projects with the funding uh, to both a supporter audience um, and engaging the research community in our work. So did videos, writing articles, podcasts, monthly newsletters, social media, managed the websites. Um, however, it also broadened out to cover a bit of marketing, um, running science events, organizing conferences, developing new programs of work, such as creating a summer school and celebration event for undergraduate students to learn transferable research skills, um, which I think is really important. Um, and what I learned from this job was that I love talking about science, um, but probably more importantly, supporting early career researchers to excel, um, as well as developing new um, programs and processes to help this happen. Um, I'd really recommend working for a small charity if you want to gain a breadth of experience um, quite fast um, and also getting creative with ideas as you've got more scope to explore new ideas um, and work across teams. So that takes me uh, to the present day at the Woodland Trust, where I use most of those transferable skills that I, I learned through the last few roles um, in my current role. Um, I think one of the main pieces of advice I have for looking for a career in any sector is that transferable skills are really important. And you probably hear me say this all the time, but I really think that they are important. Um, and if you write down what you've developed while you're still in that job, uh, I recommend it so that you don't forget what you've learnt um, and you can use those examples um, as you apply for other opportunities. So finally, I just wanted to go through and give you an insight and in some of the roles that we do have at the Woodland Trust that you can use your conservation knowledge in and we'd love to have you, um, which might inspire perhaps your next career move. Um, so there are a huge number of roles at the Woodland Trust uh, that you can use your conservation knowledge in. I'm only putting a few of them up here. Um, so we have the conservation outcomes and evidence team at the Trust, which I sit in. Um, and we develop and apply conservation and ecological expertise, which is derived from our own and other people's science, evidence and delivery experience, um, internally and externally to achieve our conservation mission and objectives. Uh, we have the campaigning team, um, so you can work in campaigns, providing meaningful campaigning opportunities for our growing number of supporters and members. Um, there's conservation policy that you can move into, um, who are responsible for the development of trust policy positions on key conservation issues. Uh, we have external affairs who develop and nurture and grow our profile and influence uh, with political audiences and Westminster across the UK and with local public bodies. Um, we have comms and engagement roles um, who plan and deliver a wide range of events across the region, um, regions to encourage people to visit and uh, enjoy our wonderful woods and tell them all about the brilliant work. Um, we have roles managing our, our sites. We have over a, a thousand 
uh, woodland sites uh, across the UK. Um, and our site managers keep these woods thriving for both wildlife and for people. Uh, they plan and carry out a wide variety of practical conservation and estate management projects um, that help care for and protect our woodlands. And we have outreach advisors who work with partnerships and other organizations and local landowners to deliver our, our protection creation and, and restoration work on the ground. And we have a lot of other um, really important areas as well, more that I can talk about here, um, working in our fundraising and development, marketing comms, uh, working with supporters, volunteers, citizen science, uh, and a lot, and a lot, lot more. So I hope that's given you a little bit of flavor about um, the Woodland Trust and what working at the Woodland Trust can be like. Um, thank you so much um, for giving me this opportunity. Um, I hope that was helpful. I'm really happy to answer any questions here or through social media um, or the Discord server as well. Thanks so much, Emily. I don't know if you can uh, if you can hear me or not now. <laughs> yeah. I think I might have frozen. We can still hear you, Tanith. Okay, very sorry about that. <laughs> Am I back? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, for some reason, it just completely kicked me out of Zoom. So that was brilliant. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, thank you so much for that uh, talk, Emily. That was really cool. And so interesting to see like all the different things you can do um, within an organisation such as the Woodland Trust. Um, I think there's been a lot of interest in the chat about your stand-up comedy. <laughs> How did you communicate your science in that way? What 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 sort of aspects did you include? Uh, if I could remember any of it, I, I'd give you a demo now, but <laughs> for my own sake. <laughs> um, I think it's just, it was just thinking about the, the what, what I was researching and then just trying to think of funny ways of, of explaining it. Um, it was more of a story, storytelling about research and then just picking up some of the funny, funny aspects about it. So I was researching um, things called uomycetes, which can be um, quite a funny and difficult thing. It was a difficult thing for me to say at first. So I, I'd talk about how, how my experience went through that. Um, yeah, it is, it is terrifying communicating your research through comedy, but I think quite a few universities do it now. Um, they, they travel around and, and do a scheme like that. So I definitely recommend um, giving it a go. I think it is such a great way to communicate it because uh, comedy is so relatable and, you know, it, it, it's so pleasurable to watch that it really makes people enthused about the actual science that is then being communicated through that. And that's really cool. Um, I think for time purposes, we'll move on. And then if anyone's got any questions, especially about working at the Woodland Trust, um, we can come back to those um, in a minute. Um, so we have Sharon Hurl next. Um, she's the Eastern Regional Conservation Manager for Butterfly Conservation. Uh, Butterfly Conservation is an amazing uh, organization uh, working towards the conservation of hundreds of but butterfly and moth species um, across the UK. So really happy. Um, to have her here today. Um, but yeah, Sharon, if you want to uh, go ahead and Hello. present. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Oh, great. Okay. I'm going to try um share my screen and then that will help prompt me with the uh, talk I'm going to, to give about working at butterfly conservation. So hopefully that will work. Is that, can, is the screen, can it be seen? Yes, perfectly. 
Okay, all right. Well, I'm Sharon Hurl, and I'm going to give this um, talk today about working at butterfly conservation, very much from my perspective, um, working as regional manager in the east of England. I've been working, um, I've been very lucky, immensely lucky to work for butterfly conservation for 19 years now. And um, prior to that, I worked uh, with the Wildlife Trust for 10 years. So um, a, a fabulous working career, really. Before that, I did little stints with local authorities um, doing housing. I did another stint doing uh, public rights away, footpaths and bridleways, and, and lots of different jobs in factories and all sorts. So like for your previous speaker, transferable skills, perhaps in a different way, uh, working with people, working with local councillors, but all really helpful in, in getting that step on the ladder with, with, uh, with the Wildlife Trust and then the, um, and then the um, butterfly conservation. So we're quite a small organisation. Um, we're the largest uh, organisation concerned with the conservation of insects, but in, to in terms of um, people working for us is about 80 um, and some of those are part-time and some of those are on short-term contracts where funding has limited the, the length of the contract for example. Um, I'm full-time and I work from home a lot of our staff also work from home and um, it's a really varied job um, there's lots of aspects to the work I do but everything is all geared towards um, enabling butterflies and moths to, to thrive and, and be enjoyed uh, by everybody. So um, we want to see obviously landscapes of butterflies. So a lot of my work is, is involved in advising landowners um, on the ground about things that they can do uh, to improve the situation for various species and lots of staff were involved in this aspect of work as well. Um, and we really concentrate on threatened species as well. So um, lots of our work is, is quite specific uh, on, on, on threatened species. And we collect data. So there'll be jobs that particularly at head office which are involved in managing and interpreting all the data that we get from uh, staff and particularly from volunteers. So you'll see a few images here that the growth of monitoring, it, mo butterfly monitoring, and more recently moth monitoring um, is really grown in the UK. And that gives us some real confidence with our data to produce uh, distribution maps, to show trends, so we've um, in more recent years employed statisticians to um, help us interpret all this mass of data that, that people collect. And then we can um, use this data that we've got to help dis, uh, work out what to do on certain sites, but for our rarer species, um, for instance, here, here in Woodlands, um, some of our, our rare species, such as the patilleries, really do depend on open space, coppicing, uh, wide open sunny rides. Um, so uh, interpreting that information to, to landowners is, is very valuable. And then backing that up with, with data, which is collected by volunteers or staff and, and, and can show, show the difference. Here, here's one example here. Grizzle skipper in Harps. She's only got five sites now. We haven't got uh, time to get that one wrong. So our volunteers are monitoring that little butterfly at those sites every year. Um, they are helping with habitat management to make sure it's in pristine condition for that butterfly. And working also with a, a student at York University, Fiona Bell, who's doing her PhD on this butterfly, so that um, the data from from the work from the observations here can help her interpret the bigger picture. Moths too, 
Um, I've been really busy with this particular lovely day flying moth, and this is working with farmers and local authorities about management of road verges and arable margins. Um, so there's a lot of uh, work involved in that with, with other partnership organisations. So a lot of our work is with um, volunteers, and that's perhaps where the transferable skills come in, um, because although these are volunteers looking at wildlife, they could be volunteers in any walk of life, really. And the top picture, there's a real expert there with the hat on. He spent a lifetime uh, studying volunteers. And here he is explaining to this group here uh, what he knows, passing on those skills. And then we've got a moth trapping event down below. So the staff and volunteers work closely together and <clears throat> run events, uh, which, is, which is obviously quite fun. And then we've got lots of citizen science projects. So we've got staff that uh, provide the link between um, all the volunteers collecting this data and collating it locally, and then putting it together with the statisticians for the big picture. Education, there are different staff involved in education, both schools and, and, and higher up the ladder to make sure the next, um, uh, generation are, are interested and informed about butterflies and, and moths. Fundraising. So uh, a, a number of people at Butterfly Conservation are actually fundraisers and marketing people to slightly different skills. And um, this is a one of the projects that we've recently completed the funding on. And this is this is vital. We I spend quite a bit of my time uh, working with staff at head office to and the, the finance people to put together projects that can be funded, um, and that enables us to bring new staff in to to run these projects. A lot of staff at Butterfly Conservation start off as project staff, short term project staff, perhaps for six months, perhaps perhaps for three years. In fact, I started off like that, and then. Um, you soon realise if you can get more funding in, you can keep your post going. Um, I would say um, to work at Butterfly Conservation, you, you, I do think demonstrating a real interest in butterflies is, and, and moths is, or other wildlife, but a real personal interest is really quite, quite important. And one of the things I've been doing is a, is a, a transect, this is quite a big commitment, but on a, on a wonderful site here, but other people can do volunteer work parties. But if you haven't got access to, to rare species or important sites, you, you, you can still do um, studies close to home. During lockdown, lockdown, I ended up studying the small white butterfly at my front door, which was feeding on the, on the old bleacher by the, by the front porch there. And I busily watched them, the caterpillars, um, climbing up to the porch bit by bit from 22nd of October, right round to 19th of January. So um, studies that are close to home but demonstrate that interest can also be, be undertaken by anybody. Um, so I think that's all I was going to say um, on, the, on the slides. Thank you very much. And I'm really happy to take questions or chat to people about any aspect of, <coughs> excuse me, working you know, for, for butterfly conservation or indeed a, a small wildlife, wildlife charity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that was, it's amazing to see, you know, what necessarily potentially is, seems like quite a small organisation in terms of like staff numbers and stuff can make such a difference to to conservation um, in in a whole country like the UK. That's really cool. Um, and yeah, I guess you know the the, the options to get involved in uh, sh like smaller scale studies um, and larger projects as a volunteer um, is is really cool as well. Um, is there are there any questions that anyone um, has at this point?
So feel free to put any in the chat um, or speak up if you want to, um, or we can just uh, have a, a bit of discussion between, between our speakers. Um, this event is recorded, so if that you want to go back to look at any of the slides or any more of the information, um, then you can you can go and do that as well afterwards. We'll be uploading this um, to YouTube as well. Um, I guess, uh, Sharon, what what sort of um, how I know you've sort of said about sort of expressing an interest in butterflies and moths specifically. Um, that makes a lot of sense. What how where can we go if we would like to get involved in uh, butterfly conservation as a volunteer? Um, where can we go to find out about any opportunities sort of in our in our local area? The best place to go is, is the local branches. We, we've got branches of volunteers across the whole country and Scotland and, and Wales as well. So that's probably the best place to see what what particular schemes they're they're, they're running at the moment um, and then join in one of those. We've got things like recording schemes as well as uh, practical events. So, for instance, in Cambridgeshire, there's a practical event near Newmarket on Sunday, um, but other other branches will have other things that people can get involved in. Amazing, thank you. Does anyone else have any any questions they would like to ask anyone who's who's been involved uh, today? If not, um, we can wrap up the session um, now. Tanda, Tanda, Sorry? I, I was just going to um, mention how the sort of partnership working and that side of things um, is so important as well. And it's really interesting that the, for the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology partners with both Butterfly Conservation and indeed the Woodland Trust as well, and, and many, many other organisations we all partner. And I think that sort of seeing in the chat around um, transferable skills and um, yeah, those sort of collaborations, partnerships and um, networking uh, are so valuable. And so events like this are really, really highlight, um, yeah, highlight the importance of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, we had that earlier with our keynote as well. Um, someone mentioning um, just kind of how, um, you know, building those collaborations and even just getting in touch with people that you might be interested in working with um, and just kind of starting that dialogue and that conversation can lead to some really um, amazing collaborations from there as well. That's a really good point. Yeah, and also seeing the um, overlap of different types of opportunity in the different organisations. So just you know, science communication is becoming, I mean, it's always been important, but it's becoming increasingly recognised for the importance. And so we've sort of seen from many of the speakers the importance of that communication and the variety of ways in which we go about that um, communication and the, the need for science communication experts and all of the many other roles that we've seen um, and I think that, yeah, if people went to the CH um, pages and saw all of the variety of jobs. I think it's really inspiring to think what people can do with their, their biology um, degrees going forward or indeed other degrees going forward that can then come and be interdisciplinary with, with um, biologists. Absolutely. I think as well, you know, all of you have sort of mentioned in some form, yeah, those other other skills that you might have that you can then relate to conservation uh, or ecology work um, and sort of you know com like comedy shows things like that as well and I think there's there is hopefully becoming a bit more of an emphasis on a lot of sort of more artistic art artistic yeah. rather um, uh, skills as well that can be brought into how we communicate uh, yeah. science and conservation work and how we can use those um, and kind of involve involve that in in the work that we do um yeah really cool yeah I think that interdisciplinary aspect is is just um so important and and working across the arts and humanities and all of the various research councils um the medical research council the biotechnology natural environment and um you know I think that um it's not always easy to work across disciplines because sometimes we speak different languages and um, have different sort of sets of jargon and things um, but it's so rewarding 
when when we all listen to one another and take some time to be able to develop ideas in that collaborative way. And yeah, it's been just amazing seeing all that diversity represented um, this afternoon through from the filmmaking through to the people walking butterfly transects. It's, it's just fantastic. I was just going to add on to that point as well, because you're saying about obviously the interdisciplinary um, and creatively communicating science as well. And I think that people forget actually being creative is a really valuable skill to have in science, being able to adapt and being able to communicate things in a different way is really essential because although we are some of the people doing the research and the science, the research that we're doing is for everyone, it's for the benefit of the planet, of the world, of all these other people. So it's important that the people we're doing the research for, that they can understand it just as easily as we're understanding it, which is why I think it's so great to have all these different ways of communicating it so you've got so many podcasts you've got all these niche kind of comedy shows and that kind of thing and I think it really helps to engage people in science in different ways it doesn't just have to be through your school or through educational programs there are so many different ways now Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's also just hopefully really inspiring to, for example, school students who may be thinking about a career in science, but maybe they're concerned that of the sort of stereotypes of being in a lab and it being quite constrained and quite formulaic. And actually, you know, I mean, I went through quite a conventional sort of from science A levels to a science degree to a master's and PhD, but I love the creativity in it. I love the designing of experiments or studies as well as the creativity of um, science communication and and seeing what other people do in communication. I love science comedy. I would be hopeless, totally hopeless. And but I love watching it and seeing how other people shine in these ways. So yeah, I think it's wonderful to sort of recognize that because I think that myself as a 18 year old going off to do a biology degree, I would never have thought of the all these variety of ways in which we go about communicating and um and yeah and the value of of comedy and storytelling so yeah i think that's really great i think recognizing as well that you know we we there's this very much a stereotype that people involved in science uh, are not very creative and actually i think science itself is an incredibly creative process and the way that you have to think and explore and question um, is absolutely crucial to that. So I think sometimes remembering that actually, you know, not to be scared of being slightly more creative and communicating your science more creatively, because actually you already have those skills to do that because your job is basically a very creative job, but we don't realize, we don't sort of make that connection. Um, so yeah, I totally agree that, you know, we need to kind of uh, like harness that a bit as well. I really struggled as a scientist for a long time um, with that bridge between art and science, um, I almost did an art degree and decided, you know, my not my hunger for science was too much, and I wanted to study science instead. But throughout my science career, I think there's always been that part of me that has struggled to find the artistic side in science, and I think that's why I like science communication so much because it does bridge the two really well. And I love, I love the visual side of science, and so I think. The visual language of communicating research for me is is really exciting. I think um, just to touch on that point, uh, I think in biology in particular, ecology, I think being creative is, is especially important because um, I think uh, it, was, it was quite normal uh, to, to see or to hear about, you know, people trying to balance the academic or academia with something creative, especially when I was at university and there was almost a um, your experience of trying, you know, being a bit indecisive and not really knowing if you wanted to do an art degree or a science degree. I was in exactly the same position. I think a lot of people were surprised when I actually did some, you know, went down the zoology route rather than going into like fine art and photography. Um, but I think the two things actually are uh, not necessarily mutually exclusive. I think they actually are intertwined, uh, especially when you're trying to think of uh, a hypothesis generating. So you're just trying to think of new ideas and ways to tackle certain problems. I think if you aren't creative, you aren't going to be a good scientist. I think you you get weeded out very quickly if you're particularly very rigid in thinking. Um, so, yeah, no, I just want to touch on that. But what I did also want to ask you, um, 
because you touch upon like transferable skills and I wanted to ask what was what do you think was the is the most important skill that he had learned like um in your journey to going get into PhD post PhD and now in science communication um I think excuse me um not necessarily well I think it is a skill in itself actually is recognize it's going to sound like a a cop-out answer but recognizing your own skills is probably one of the greatest skills so you you know everyone's got a massive skill set it's really tapping into knowing when to apply those certain skills and when to explore them further um if if that makes sense if that isn't too conceptual an answer so I knew I was interested in science communication, so I really wanted to try and explore as many opportunities as I could to grow that skill. Um, Through my PhD, I knew, I didn't really realise until I finished my PhD, the amount of skills that I'd learnt through it. So working out what skills I'd actually learnt through gaining that experience, I think was was really valuable. Wow. Yeah. If I can just add to that as well, I was just going to say sometimes you're not. Sometimes you realise that you're using a skill that you learned ages ago doing some other job that's not related to what you're doing now, and you're like, oh, that's the reason I can do this, or that's the reason that I'm comfortable doing this. Sometimes you're surprised that actually what skills you are able to transfer. Um, I think is always really surprising. So even like we we're saying about like doing creative activities such as photography actually when you're doing microscopy it can really help if you have a decent eye when it comes to looking (laughs) through a lens and down a camera Um, so all these things you're never actually sure when your skills are going to be relevant and that's why I think it's so important to like pursue what you're passionate in and pursue what you really care about and what really interests you if there's a certain skill that you think is really interesting then go and learn it as part of my PhD doing things like histopathology and looking at the actual tissues was never a part of my PhD but I thought that's a really cool skill and maybe I want to go into veterinary research when I'm older. So I went out and got that skill. Similarly, although my PhD project is focused on poultry and agriculture, I still want to have the skills in working in conservation in case those opportunities come up later on. So that's why I do the additional volunteering because I really care about it and I'm passionate about it and it might lead to something after my PhD. Sounds great. Um, There's been a question in the chat that's related to that actually. Um, Darren Moorcroft's asked, um, he'd be interested in what skills uh, did the speakers wish they had before they started working in conservation that they have been able to develop? So what things, yeah, did you did you wish you have before? For me personally, uh, one of the things I think is a skill that I'm always just going to have to work on is statistics performing statistics, like setting up experiments and thinking about how that's going to be statistically significant, thinking about those kind of concepts is always difficult for me. I always need support with it. Slowly, I'm getting much better at it. But yeah, conceptualizing statistics and actually turning that fieldwork into numbers has always been something that I've found particularly challenging. Um, I know that's more of a specific skill, but I'm sure it's something that other people have experienced as well. I definitely had to work very hard at statistics, but actually once I started to just relax about it and think, do you know what, I'm sure I can do this, it actually became a lot easier. And I think, um, yeah, we don't have to all be really fantastic at all of these different things, um, which is a good thing for me. Um, There are people who we can we can work with. And um, so I think actually that sort of skill of building teams and um, working alongside others and um, it's really joyful, but also just amazing in terms of then um, what you can do as, as, a, as a collective, if you like, because I think, for example, when I've done projects in schools and around science communication, I know very little about education, even having had two daughters who've been through an education system, I probably would, I'm atrocious at managing to communicate um, to very 
to very young children in the way that's required within schools. I can give a lot of enthusiasm and tell stories, but in terms of a sort of curriculum, but working with education experts is just fantastic. And then working with people who can create designs that are really appealing through that education part is another just really, it's been a wonderful experience. And then I can see, um, Mark Gurney's here and I think of all the skills that um, are the taxonomists of people who can identify so many different species and take amazing pictures and know the right pictures to take to help us all out with our identification and so I think it's that that team working and what we all bring when we come together is just amazing. I suppose that yeah that comes back to that that what we were talking about before about collaborating um, with other people so whether that's you know individuals who have other skills that you might not necessarily possess yet um, or whether that's other organizations who might have other skills or that they that they can harness um, yeah definitely I, I would certainly say that, it, that the pace of um, development of technology um, and it's always great when um, people like me who've been in the organization a long time can be introduced to new stuff that younger people joining us bring such as you know, mapping soft using mapping software um, and, and other technological things like that that, that I never covered at, at university or in previous jobs but but need to need to use now so keeping pace with that and that's what new younger starters bring certainly to butterfly conservation it's really valuable yeah, we see that as well here at CH. I think as well, thinking about things like finance, I, I'm, I'm not great on budgets, but thankfully I work with amazing people who can manage finance um, things. So I think it's when you're within an organisation, it may be a conservation organisation, but all of the sort of infrastructure that's there as well, um, it's just absolutely critical to be able to then do what we do, which, which is exciting to us in terms of the ecology, for instance, but without the support of all the people who can manage contracts and finance and the facilities. So again, I think it's all about this sort of team, that, that, that team. I guess another question um, that might interest a lot of the, the audience um, is how, um, what sort of uh, things you need to kind of what's sort of the, the the kind of most important thing I guess when you're entering conservation to to have um yeah what, what sort of yeah what's the most important important thing I think passion has to be the first thing like you have to be passionate about it conservation is hard work and it's also competitive like it is difficult to get entry level jobs in conservation I remember when I finished my undergraduate it was really daunting but if you're passionate I think that really comes across like if you can really show that you're enthusiastic with something and that you're engaged with it just as we were talking about earlier about you know show that you're interested in butterflies and moths like take the time to learn a little bit more about them and to kind of feed that passion that you've got and I think that will really come across even if you don't necessarily have specific skills they're looking for if you can show that you are passionate engaged and interested people are willing to train you mm. I would, I'd also add to that persistence too, I think, because I feel like a lot of people do get disheartened um, when they see a rejection uh, or they may have their sights on one thing and then when it doesn't necessarily come for, to fruition, they might you know, not necessarily continue in that pathway, especially in conservation. Um, that happens a lot. I've spoken to a lot of people, especially undergrads, that are very you know, optimistic about having a, you know, that dream job in conservation that has a lot of field work, et cetera. Um, and when that doesn't come about and then there are quite, well, isn't, there aren't as many opportunities comparison to other um, career paths, um, they get very disheartened and then are, are quick to leave. But I would say if you are passionate and persistent, it will something will happen and something will um, or just come into play. So I definitely say persistence is definitely something that I, it's an important skill to have. One thing I would say is that it, it, keep an eye on job adverts, even if you're not looking at the moment. Um, look at job adverts and see what the organisation asks for and look at the essential and the desirable 
um, uh, attributes they ask for in the job description because that and if you do that really early on that can help um, see what people will be looking for when when you really are looking for a job later on yeah and just to add to Sharon's point you can apply for a job if you don't meet all of the yes, oh, yeah. criteria on a job application if you can show that you have the willingness willingness to learn those skills then you can still apply as long as you show your you know your passion and really demonstrate those other skills that you do have for the role as well i think that's how i actually got into the, my current job role as in i I'm, i've got no um, background in psychology. I think everyone I work with has got a PhD in psychology, but they still was passionate about science. I applied because I just, was just interested in a research. And when it came to the interview day, it just came across and I'm like, yeah, um, you know, you've got a lot of transferable skills. Um, yeah, you, you might not necessarily have the expertise in psychology, but you have the framework mm -hmm. to be able to you know, we, we can build on that. And as Bush has said, we can just train you. You can we trust that you can learn quickly on the job. Um, that's what happened, really. So I would say that definitely keep your options open. But yeah, definitely have that passion persistence. And, you know, um, have an, keep an eye out on the, you know, the application, the job application. Just keep, it, it will happen, mm -hmm. uh, guaranteed. I think that's really excellent. Um, yeah, everyone's points are really excellent. But I, you it was fascinating to see your your day in the life Ruben and that um sort of publishing and um it, you know I think as ecologists if someone has an interest in words and publishing and and writing then there are many many jobs out there within science that aren't necessarily just on the ecology but are just as valuable and would be just as interesting and so I think sometimes this as well looking yeah looking more broadly but um, having that optimism and um, belief in aspiring for, for what you're going to really enjoy doing. I would also just add as well to that, um, if you are looking for additional support, there are lots of mentors available, more so than people realise. I massively benefited from having a mentor and part of it was just kind of boosting that confidence. And Emily mentioned earlier, it's a skill just to know what your skills are and just to learn what your skills are. And I think having a mentor, particularly if you're an early careers researcher, can really help you to find your feet and to figure out the path that you want. So I would definitely recommend looking into mentorship schemes. Um, I really think that benefits so many people. And I think that goes all the way through your career. When I became president of the Royal Entomological Society, I sought out some mentoring because I thought there are gaps here that I want to chat through um, around that particular role. So I, that mentoring has been really important. And sometimes it's in, informal. You just stray upon someone who you sort of adopt. And other times it might be for a formal uh, mentoring scheme. I think relating um, to all of that is that expectation that you're, I think coming into this field, you're, you have this expectation that you need to know everything or that you can do everything already. And actually when you get your first job or the next le level of study or whatever it might be, actually you, you're not expected to know everything already and that learning on the job is actually a whole part of that process. So again, not being afraid to apply for those jobs that you don't necessarily know you can fit into just yet or that because that will come. Um, yeah, so I totally agree with what's been said. Um, oh, the Biodiverse Project, uh, I'm not sure who's running that today, um, has just mentioned that the British Ecological Society and uh, SEAM have mentoring schemes that you can apply to. Um, so yeah, definitely look out for for mentoring, uh, mentoring schemes as well. Um, I've just noticed the time and that we're, we are running over. Um, it's been such an interesting discussion. I don't really want to stop now. I'm learning a lot as well, um, but I'm going to, I am going to wrap up now because we are, we are out of time. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us um, and for all the speakers who have given up their time today. It's been a really interesting discussion, some really interesting presentations. Um, and some really wonderful insights into day in the life, which I think when you're starting out is such a valuable thing to be able to see as well and to, to really know, you know, what, what the sort of things you can get into are and, and what people, what it looks like to work in this field. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. This will be recorded and uh, put onto YouTube for anyone who couldn't make it today. 
Um, but I think we'll we'll end there. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you.